Hey everybody, welcome back to the welcome back to the tour of my of my zoo called Biopark Zoo. So far, we are in this part of the zoo, from the spotted seal all the way to the scimitar oryx, and now we'll be on this part of the exhibit. The first animal we're gonna check out is the Somali wild ass. I mean, not swearing here, but that's the actual name of this animal. The Somali wild ass. Let's take a look. So here they are, the Somali wild... Here we have the Somali wild ass. The Somali wild ass is a subspecies of the African wild ass. Which could be... Oh, let me follow it. Oh, let's go follow it here. Beautiful creature. Oh yeah, about what I was gonna say. Oh yeah, the Somali wild ass is a subspecies of the African wild ass that lives in the hilly and stony deserts and arid to semi-arid arid bushlands and grasslands of northeastern Somalia and north northern Ethiopia, which is in Africa. And they're found in Somalia, the South Red Sea region of Eritrea, and the Afar region of Ethiopia. And unfortunately, these guys are classified as critically endangered animals. Critically in if you don't know what critically endangered is, endangered is, it means these guys face an extremely high risk of extinction in the wild. And a few hundred specimens live in Somalia, Eritrea, and Ethiopia. But there are likely less than 1,000 animals. Or even 700 of these guys still in the wild today. Mm. Let's see right here. Oh yeah, we have the other one right here eating. I don't know. There'd be a wire in danger. Oh yeah, and the re and if you're wondering why they're critically endangered, and it's because more and more of them are competing with domestic livestock for limited grazing grounds and water sources. It is very sad to see for these animals. Alright. Now I think it's time to feed these guys. Don't you think? Let me get out my stylus here. So these guys are herbivores, which means that they like to eat plants. Grass is their favorite food, but they also eat shrubs and other desert plants. And like most of our grazing animals, they first glass, grasp a plant with their strong lips, pull it in their mouths, and then tear it off with their teeth, and enlarge it at flat surfaces. And now see the animation, and tell some fun facts about the Somali wild ass. Did you know that in the 1500s, the Spanish brought domestic African wild asses to the south of the U.S.? And their descendants still roam the southwest today, which we often call them burros, which is the Spanish, which is Spanish for donkey. On oh, yeah, and these guys may be small, but they're very fast, and they've been clocked, clocked at around 30 miles per hour. Can you believe that? All right, let's move on to the next animal on our list. The next animal we are going to show you guys is the Gemsbok. Okay. Look at it. Let's go pay him a visit. Alright, now we have the Gemsbok. So Gemsboks are very large antelopes who have adapted to life in hot, dry areas 
for most larger mammals can adapt to. And these guys are viable by getting water from fruits and vegetables can withstand temperature changes up to 45 degrees Celsius. They spend most of their days inactive and in the shade. The males weigh between 167 and 209 kilograms, with a height of about 1.2 meters. And their horns are nearly straight, almost parallel, averaging about 76 centimeters long, and known to impale an attacking lion. Onyani live in the dry savanna woodland, rocky areas, sand dunes, and sand dunes in the Kalahari and Ibid deserts in southern Africa. And there's another one right over there, if you can find it. Now where is he? We know he's around here somewhere. Where is that game spot? Oh, there he is. He's right over there. He just had to move more a bit. Oh, and yeah. Their most distinctive feature, like these, like I said, are their long rapier-shaped horns and striking black and white facial markings. And we have two right here. Oh, yeah, and their beautiful horns are sought after as charms in many cultures, and were even sold as unicorn horns in medieval England. Can you believe that? Let's see, I think it's time to feed them. So like the Somali wild ass from earlier, these guys are herbivores, and they like to eat seed pods, fruit, fruits, and grasses. And they don't even need that much water, as they get the water they need from the plants that they eat. Alright. Now let's see their animation. Meanwhile, we'll tell some fun facts about the Gemsbok. Gemsbok straight weepier horns can reach 120 centimeters in length and are longer and narrower than the females, which they use in territorial combat and as lethal weapons against predators, like, like lions. Their low metabolism allow them to survive for much of the year without drinking, which they get the moisture they need from their food, like desert melons that they dig up in times of drought. A drought. With most of our Kalharni antelope, one dominant breeding male controls a harem of females and young and bachelor male. Therefore, on separate herds. By contrast, they form mixed herds of males and females, which is called a fission fusion group. Let's move on to our next animal. Our next animal here is the meerkat, which some of you may know as Timon from The Lion King. Hey, look at me, Pumba! It's me, Timon! Ah, oh, man, Pumba, look how handsome I am! Uh, the impressive you have a meerkat. Alright, let's see. Here he is, the meerkat. See where this guy is right here. Or, oh, there he is, right over here. His back is right behind us, and there he is, just right there. Anyways, these guys may have cat in their name, but they actually belong to the Kivet and Mongoose family, and their faces often have a curious look, seen taking in everything in their surroundings. And the color of their coat can be gold, silver, brown, or orange, with dark patch around the eyes. They can dig their own body weight of dirt within a few seconds, and their high endurance enables them to build elaborate tunnels. And their social cooperation within a large group and their intensively burrowed tunnels helps them survive in the arid, Af arid African deserts in which they live. And these guys have a wide distribution in southern Africa, from the extreme southwest of Angola, and Namibia, and Botswana, and into west and north South Africa, which they, which they have a dry open country with sparse woody shrub and short grass there. Along with desert. Let's see where the Avermeer cat is. Where is that guy? Where? Where is that meerkat? Where is he? Where is the meerkat? Huh. wonder where the other one is. Oh, there's one. He's sitting up right there. He's in the sentry patrol. 
Do you know why meerkats do this? The reason why the reason why meerkats often stand on their hind legs is because in the sentry group, these guys look out for predators like hawks that might eat them. Anyways, let's go feed them. I bet the meerkats are very hungry. You hungry, Timon? Oh yeah, I would I would like some bugs right about now. And that's exactly what he have. These guys are mainly insectiv insectivorous, eating insects like scorpions. Which, in fact, these guys are very immune to their venom. Not only scorpions, but they can also eat beetles, spiders, crickets, centipedes, millipedes, and worm as worms as well. They can also eat eggs, roots, roots, tubers, small reptiles, and even small mammals. Alright. Let's see their animation. Oh, telling some fun facts. Meerkats can move 50 times their body weight of sand and dig 400 holes in just half a day. Their very keen sense of smell enables them to locate prey, which they'll dig out using their long clawed forefeet. The black patches around their eyes help protect them against the sun's constant glare, which are kind of like sunglasses on a human. Able to survive drinking no water, they get the necessary moisture from the tubers and roots. As well as for like the sa the sama lemon, I mean the sama melons. Oh yeah, and did you know that in the Lion King, Timon is a Timon is a meerkat. Besides, who here loves watching the who here remembers watching the Lion King? Tell me in the comments below. And when standing erect, they'll bounce on their long stiff tails, using it like a kickstand for a bicycle. Oh yeah, and young the young are so afraid of birds that airplanes will scare them into their burrows. Here it goes. And as an adaptation to living in a sandy habitat, they're able to close their ears so that sand will stay out. And also, the fur eye will detect their eyes. So that's enough about the meerkats. Let's move on to the next animal. With the next animal being... Being the giant moa. Look at the MOA. Let's see. Where's that MOA? Let's go search. Oh, there he is. Oh, man, that's a very huge bird indeed. Look at this guy. So this guy is a giant MOA, Dinernus. Which are actually, there are two kinds of species of Diurnus. The Northern Island Giant Moa and the South Island Giant Moa. Which these big birds... Which these big birds are very flightless birds. They're starting to find a keel. Ah uh, yeah, and in... And in fact, they occupied a wide, wide range of vegetative... Habitats and close to the inland shrubland forests and sub sub alpine herb fields and grasslands in the North Island Ajio Great Barrier Island in New Zealand. Which not only were there giant moas, there were, also, there were six other species of moas as well. Like the Pachyurnus, Animalopteryx, Eurapteryx, Megalopterus, and Diurnus, which is the one that we have here. But, sad but sadly enough, they went extinct due to overhunting by humans for food, and their chicks being eaten by the introduced Polynesian dog, which is known as the Curie. And they're often prey by the Haas Eagle, the biggest bird that ever flew New Zealand. Huh. Speaking of which, I think it's time to feed this guy. So these guys, maybe... So based on their skull and their... It's in their skull, bill morphology, they probably... 
It's probably likely that these guys were herbivores, which means that these birds liked eating plants. Oh yeah, and they liked eating a fibrous diet of leaves and twigs, as well as flowers, berries, and seeds from trees, shrubs, and, and shrubs and vines were also taken. But they consumed a few herbs and grasses, though. Let's see its animation. On yeah. And did you know that DNA study shows that these guys were more closely related to Tinamos than to the ki than the modern Kiwis in New Zealand? It's kind of wild, by the way. Look at this. Alright. Let's move on. To the reindeer. Alright, let's go meet some more animals. The next animal we're about to meet is the reindeer, also known as a caribou. Oh yeah. These guys are often called reindeer in Eurasia and caribou in North America, and are charismatic and hardy species that inhabit the northern regions of the planet, which is the tundra and taiga of the Arctic Circle. While they may occur as a number of different subspecies throughout their range, all of them are superbly adapted to a life in the extreme conditions of the north and where they live. Their coats are made of a thick woolly underlayer, and overcoat of stiff tubular hairs, which trap a layer of insulating air. Though their color to come may vary from location almost back to here, right, it's generally brown to gray on the upper parts and pale to white. Mump. And they're the only deer species in the world in which the males and females only have antlers. Oh yeah, and there's two of them right there. Let's take a picture of them. And during the autumn and winter, their hooves harden and develop sharp edges which are used for breaking through the snow and ice and searching for food. And hair between them prevents snow from clogging them up. And yeah, these guys are very famous in Christmas. And around the cor around the corner next month in December, you may or may not see see Santa running running with these guys. And there, there are seven no, oh, there are seven reindeer in Santa's sleigh, including Rudolph the Rendo's reindeer. Who here's excited for Christmas? You can tell in the comments below. Alright, I think it's time to feed the caribou. Oh yeah, and these guys have the subarctic forests in Arctic Tundra, Greenland, North and North America, and they're from Europe across the East Asia. Let's go feed them, shall we? And these guys are herbivores, mainly in grasses, herbs, sedges, mosses, twigs, fungi, and lichen. In the winter, they dig with their hooves into the snow, which is called cratering to find a lichen they often eat, which is known as reindeer moss. You know, which is, which is what they eat, hence the name. Mm. Oh yeah, and they were some of the last animals human domesticated, considered by some to still not be fully tame. Which, now these guys are semi-domestic animals. There are about 2.5 million domestic reindeer in 9 countries, with about 100,000 people tending to them. Extremely half the world's total reindeer population. Domestications lead to have begun between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Siberian owners of reindeer ride, ride on them, and a single owner may have hundreds, sometimes thousands of them. And fur and meat are very important income sources. And towards the close, close in the 19th century, they introduced in Alaska and they're, they interbreed with native reindeer subspecies. In Scandinavia countries, their meat is popular, and reindeer are powdered and sold in Asian markets as a medicinal nutrient supplement. 
Oh yeah, and in the North Pole, you often see Santa with center reindeer. reindeer. Which, as the song of Long of Who the Red Nose Reindeer goes, have Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Jupiter, Donner, and Blitzen. Let's tell some fun facts about them. I'll let you guys watch the animation again if you like. Look at them. I'm so excited for Christmas at all, are you guys? Our next animal around here is the Tasmanian Tiger, or Tasmanian Wolf, also known as the Phylacene. Alright, let's see where it, is, where it is. There he is, right here. Oh. Oh man, I almost, I almost caught him yawning there. Oh yeah. And these guys were one of the largest marsupial carnivores in the world. But unfortunately, they're widely believed to be extinct. Oh. Let's go follow it. Unfortunately, the reason for their extinction is believed to be climate change. Well, yeah, they probably went extinct due to climate change, humans hunting them, to unable to protect their livestock, as well as competition against dingoes, which were introduced from the island a long time ago from, from the Aborigines in Southeast, in Southeast Asia, which, the ding, which is where the dingo originally lived. Thanks to that, the Tasmanian tiger was now restricted to Tasmania, and... Unfortunately, the last one died in the Harvard Zoo in Australia. Australia in 1946. And they were one of the largest kind of marsupials in modern times. And today, these guys may be the closest swimming relative to today's Tasmanian Devil or Numbat. And they, these guys are very kind of shy and avoiding humans. So they weren't very dangerous to us. The re even though they may not be related to tigers or wolves, they're called Tasmanian tigers because of this. If you can see the stripes right there, if you can see the stripes right there on the uh, on the lower back of the animal, to see how it gets gets its name. Let's go feed them. Alright. So these guys may have been carnivores. Carnivores. And scientists think they may have aided kangaroos, wallabies, and wombats, birds, and small animals like potteroos and possums. And they may have been the once extinct Tasmanian emu, which is a subspecies of an extinct subspecies of emu that once lived in Tasmania as well, like the Tasmanian tiger or phylacine once did. Now, let's see the animation. Oh. Well. Bye, Phylocene. We'll see you later. I think that's enough of the Phylocene now. Alright. And our last animal for today is the Japanese Sero. 
Let's go find him out. Let's go. S oh, there he is. Right here. So these guys are Japanese goat antelopes. They're found in the dense woods of Japan, primarily northern and central Hans Hansho. Let's go take a picture of them. There it is. That's a good one. And these guys are seen as a national symbol of Japan and are subject to protection and conservation areas. And they're found in dense mountain forests where they eat leaves, shoots, and acorns. And are diurnal and feed in early mornings and the afternoon. And they're very solitary or gather in couples or small family groups. Or to territory with sweet and sour smelling, pure orbital gland secretions. And the males and females of separate territories that may overlap. There he is, right here. Oh yeah, and he live they have to the free of the four main islands. Oh, there's another one right up there. To so the four main islands of Japan, like Northern and Central Hantu, Norris, Yokoku, and Kyushu. Open grasslands and forests. They're temperate to citrus forests, also live in broad leaves or south subalpine coniferous forest made of Japanese beech. Means oak, alpine middle, and coniferous plant plantations. Anyways, let's go feed them. Alright, so anyways, let's go feed the Japanese sero. Well, these guys are herbivores, and these guys primarily feed on fleshy and coniferous leaves, plant shoots. It's an acorns. And that also includes alders, such Japanese witch hazel, and Japanese cedar. Let's go see the animation and we'll have fun facts about them. They're a natural symbol of Japan and protecting conservation areas. They're labeled a living national treasure of the forest. In Japan, they're widely thought of as a kind of deer, though both of the animals are in different families. In the past, the Japanese word Kamashika was when using the Chinese character for Shika, meaning deer. Today, when when using Chinese characters, the character for antelope and sheep are used. And they have a very sense of hearing and strong, very strong eyesight. And they're able to detect and react to movement from a distance, and can see while low lighting. Where are these zero now? And Japan, they're the most commonly known as... Oh, I gotta watch it. I think it's time to go now. Like I was gonna say, in Japan, they're most commonly known as Kamashika Shishi. It's historically been given a variety of names based on their appearance. Some which translates as mountain sheep, bull deer, nine-tailed cow, and cow demon. Regional names abound some which translate as dancing beast, foolish beast, or idiot. Idiot cow. Or idiot. Chinese people often characterize them as weird or normal, and seen as a phantom animal, as it tends to live alone in the a distant forest, and appears to observe forest workers near his high in the mountains. In Japanese, the word Orchiro means both to fall on exam and to fall, as they are known for their sure footedness of mountain clips. Students can buy the students can buy Orna Mori charms marked with a zero hoof print in the hope it will help them pass exams. Alright, so that's it on the second episode of my Biopark Zoo tour. Next time, next time on the tour, on tour, we'll take you, we'll take you to one of the most free, most endangered animals in the world, the Akapi, Giant Panda, and Pygmy Hippopotamus.
thank you thank you for watching this video i hope you have a marvelous day